Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll start again uh, this uh, session. Um, and uh, our speaker now is uh, Olivier Fogeras. Uh, Olivier is currently a director de recherche at INRIA, where he leads uh, the NeuromatComp uh, project team. He graduated from uh, Ecole Polytechnique in France and holds a PhD in computer science and electrical engineering from the University of Utah and a doctorate of science in mathematics from Paris' uh, university. He is the author of uh, the book Artificial 3D Vision, published uh, by MIT Press. He co-authored two other books in computer vision. He was also an adjunct uh, professor at MIT and a member of the AI lab. His current research interests are in uh, mathematical neuroscience, that is in uh, applying mathematics to model populations of neurons and applications of his work include computer and biological visual perception, neuronal diseases, plasticity and learning, models of functional imaging modalities. Olivier was elected a member of the French Academy of Sciences and is one of the funding members of the French Academy of Technology. Olivier. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. So my talk today will, will be about uh, statistical neuroscience, uh, a new area uh, which I'm trying to develop with lots of colleagues. And I think it's important uh, to understand why we need such a, such a new discipline. And I will try and do this uh, during this lecture. So as an introduction, I will show you the uh, uh, this, uh, this diagram which uh, displays the different spatial scales. So the key words is there are lots of different spatial scales in the central neural system going from uh, molecules at the synaptic levels, the neurotransmitters, to individual neurons and assemblies of individual neurons. So you have to deal with the fact that you go from the angstrom to the meter in space. The same could be said also for uh, temporal scales. There are lots of different, very different temporal scales. And one of the challenges is to deal in a principled manner with all these different uh, scales. So uh, measuring the information, uh, we know how to measure the activity of individual neurons with uh, single electrodes. Uh, we also have available uh, new technology, uh, multi-electrode arrays, which allow you to measure this activity uh, for a few hundreds of neurons. Um, of course, there are other uh, uh, modalities like optical imaging, which is kind of interesting because it's a higher level in the hierarchy. Um, this is a little bit invasive for humans, but it's okay for animals. You have to take away a bit of the skull, uh, which is shown here, and uh, you, can, you have access to uh, uh, the, some areas of the brain. And uh, with a camera, you can look at the activity which is revealed in some cases by uh, dyes. So the animal here is looking at the visual stimulus. Its brain is act in activity, and this is looked at and analyzed by the computer. But of course, the kind of populations that uh, you're looking at here is more of the hundreds of thousands of neurons uh, rather than a few hundreds like, like before. So you see the, the difference in scales. Up the ladder of scales, so to speak, uh, EEG, electroencephalography, or MEG, uh, which are two modalities which allow you to uh, measure the electrical and magnetic activity of the human brain. This is non-invasive. But of course, due to the diffusion of the uh, electromagnetic waves which are created by the brain activity, uh, you have large diffusion, and so what you measure at the electrodes or at the sensors here uh, is the activity of, let's say, millions of neurons. So we definitely need ways to represent the activity of neuronal populations at different spatial scales. I will concentrate on spatial scales uh, in, this, in this lecture. Um, other reasons for developing uh, this uh, statistical neuroscience, 
uh, are more technology uh, funded uh, or uh, they're due to uh, technological advances. For example, in the brain scale project I'm a participant of, it's a European project, people in Germany have developed uh, large-scale integrations, large-scale uh, devices that allow the practitioner to simulate, to emulate uh, millions of neurons of a certain type. So uh, it's important to be able to describe the activity of this neuron, to program this machine. Okay, so in the brain scale project, this is available. Another project, the Blue Brain Project Simulator, is also dealing with millions of, of neurons and uh, uh, coming up with descriptions of the joint activity of these neurons is quite important and in fact it is uh, it is uh, it is fundamental so these two projects uh, continue with the human brain project in europe so some of you may have heard of, uh, of. it's uh, it's uh, an ec flagship which is based in uh, in uh, in lausanne at the epfl and the brain project in the United States. So one of the reasons why you may want to describe hierarchical, to, to come up with hierarchical descriptions of populations of neurons is that if, say in the human brain project, if you simulate at a very uh, fine deep level of details the activity of, say, millions of neurons, you cannot, at least immediately, you cannot simulate the whole brain. So you need to interface this particular module that you're simulating with coarse-grained models. Okay, so these, these are a number of points uh, which you should keep in mind uh, in, my, in my presentations, in the rest of my presentation. So, uh, motivations for, a few more mot motivations for developing these representations, or these uh, statistical neuroscience. One of them is uh, related to uh, a lot of things that we've heard uh, this morning, uh, the notion of sparsity, which is uh, omnipresent in, uh, in AI or machine learning, sorry we say now. Uh, so sparse representations, of course, uh, when you're dealing with core scales of neuronal activity, you want them to be sparser than the fine grain. So that's a very important point, which I will come back to. Uh, another important point, which is the prediction, is the prediction of uh, the occurrence of new emerging neural phenomena. I'm going to show you a short movie, which is a metaphor of what I'm talking about. This is the city of Rome, and watch the sky. In the sky, you'll see clouds, actually clouds of birds. You see these beautiful shapes that are changing uh, over time. And of course, these shapes have very little to do with the individual descriptions of each, the, uh, each of the birds. So that's a metaphor for the kind of things that I'm interested in doing, is uh, you think of the neuron, the individual neuron, as an individual bird, and the populations of neurons as these flocks of, 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 of birds. So emerging neural phenomena is one uh, of, the, of the key points. Uh, another very important point is uh, understanding the role of randomness. So let me spend some time here. Uh, the brain is really a stochastic machine. If you look at uh, what happens at the level of uh, ion channels, uh, there's a lot of fluctuations which are due to thermal noise, and these fluctuations can, uh, can change completely the dynamics of the individual neuron and therefore of the populations of neurons. So understanding the role uh, of noise, so to speak, but noise here is not a bug, it's a feature, as we say in computer science. Understanding that role is, is, is key to my, to my, uh, to my uh, enterprise here. So let me take an example. So I'm going to flash equations at you. Uh, don't try to uh, understand, and of course there's no, no need, uh, what I want to do is to scare you by the amount of equations and, <laughs> and make you feel the need for something else. <laughs> okay, so V1 is one of the primary, is the uh, primary visual area. It's here in, in humans. And uh, if, so it's roughly uh, 10 to uh, 10, 10 millions of neurons. And if you write 
Uh, for each of these neurons, if you write its equations, you have this very large number. Then if you include the synaptic connections between these neurons, for example, chemicals, you, you end up with even larger number of uh, equations. And uh, you end up with, so, be seated, and you end up with this. But this 10 million times, okay, so no, no reason to try and understand. Just the idea is that it's very complicated and we need something else. So what can be done? What can be done is uh, perhaps, at least that's the road I'm following these days, uh, is to develop a statistical neuroscience. In, in the sense of, uh, in physics, they've developed uh, a statistical physics, okay? So as you all know, the inventor of uh, statistical physics is Ludwig Boltzmann. And uh, his key idea, whoops, sorry, uh, his key idea was to be able, or his, uh, his main incentive was to be able to explain and predict uh, coarse properties of matter like viscosity, thermal conductivity, diffusion, and so on and so forth, or pressure, uh, can be predicted in a statistical way from the properties of the individual constituent atoms and molecules. Okay? So we want to do the same, we want to try and do the same for, uh, for neuroscience. And uh, I, I like this picture. I sent it to Nicola, but he didn't use it. Uh, <laughs> So Santiago Ramon uh, Cajal is a, a, a genius uh, neuroanatomist uh, from Spain, and he's the inventor of the theory of the neuron. Okay, the, people didn't believe that uh, there were individual cells that were actually at the source of the brain activity. So he actually observed these neurons and drew absolutely beautiful pictures or line drawings, uh, hand drawn. And uh, so this is not very visible probably, but there's about 10 or 20 individual neurons here, which play the same role as the individual atoms here in uh, Boltzmann's uh, mind, from which he was able to explain or account for, I don't like the word explain, but account for conductivity and, and pressure, and why not try and do the same and explain the, the birth of concepts, such concepts as happiness or flowers uh, in the brain for, from the joint activity of these neurons. Okay, so that's a bold goal, very ambitious. And uh, now I will become a bit more uh, technical. I'm gonna spend some time explaining one technique, a mathematical technique called large deviations, which I think has the potential for you know, coming up with this, uh, this theory. So, uh, what is large deviation? It deals with rare events, okay? Things that happen uh, not very often, or very, uh, which are very unlikely. And these rare events are important because, uh, because basically they tell you what will not happen and uh, you're interested in what happens. So you, you take the, the converse, and uh, so these rare events, uh, large deviation principles, allow you to compute their probability, exponential decay of their probability. Uh, the key ingredient, or one of the key ingredients, is uh, what, what is called in the, in the trade as a rate function. A rate function is something which is positive. That's all we need to know. Uh, it is positive, and then let me explain here on this slide why it's important. So if you think of a sequence of random variables, the activity of n neurons, uh, we'll say that it satisfies a large deviation principle with this rate function h if the probability of xn being equal to some given number or vector x is equal to, is proportional to the exponential of minus n h of x. So you see that if h of x is positive, this probability will decrease extremely rapidly when the number of neurons n uh, grows. Okay? So clearly, and this is something also called, uh, known in mathematics as the Laplace principle for computing integrals, so the random variables x sub n, x sub n, will concentrate on the points x where 
the rate function is equal to zero. That's a key point. Okay? Furthermore, if H reaches zero at a unique point X star, then the law of Xn, the law of the neurons, which uh, converges toward the Dirac mass at this particular point. And this is the concentration of measure phenomenon. This is what happens almost always. And the events, the, uh, the events that do not contain X star have a vanishing probability. Therefore, uh, they're unimportant. So I'm analyzing, what's, I'm analyzing what's important with what turns out to be unimportant exponential decay towards zero. I'm going to run through an example for you uh, of how to apply these kind of ideas to a toy model. It's not completed toy. Uh, it's uh, based on uh, some equations that have been used very heavily in the computational neuroscience literature the Wilson and Cowan equations. So what I'm representing here is four populations of neurons, which are represented by these disks. And neuron I and neuron J are connected by synapses. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm showing here the synaptic weight, okay, so the influence, if you wish, of neuron I onto neuron J, the J sub I Js. These, of course, exist. We know that they exist, the synapses exist, but we have no idea uh, about what these values can be. Therefore, it is reasonable to model them as, as random variables, which is what I'm going to do now. So, uh, I'm considering a population of n neurons, and I will be talking about discrete and finite time t. So n is the number of neurons, and to characterize my population, I will do something very strange for some of you. I will let n go to infinity. I will assume that the population is infinite, and in fact, I will obtain a very compact and accurate description of my uh, finite population. So, uh, the uh, intrinsic dynamics, so the variable u sub i represents the membrane potential of the neuron, okay? So it's just an exponential decay plus something which is important uh, in terms of my introduction. This is noise. This is white noise, okay? So this is a, an individual neuron model without any connections. Now I'm adding the connections, okay? So I'm getting something slightly more complicated. Uh, I'm just adding the connectivity term. The J sub i j's are those of the previous diagram, and this is the equations, uh, the set of equations I have where i varies from 1 to capital N, and capital N can be 10 millions. Okay? So what are the coefficients? Well, the coefficients, as I told you, B sub i is random noise. I told you it was important, maybe channel noise. And uh, more important, the J sub i j's are I told you also that we knew that they existed, but we didn't know their values. So we model them as uh, random variables with a mean and a covariance, okay? So uh, this is the model. Forget about F. So how do we analyze this set of equations? Remember, you have 10 millions of equations. So you're interested in the trajectory, in the lifespan of a neuron from zero to T, so that's T plus one, and this is the set of trajectories for an individual neuron. Um, now, I'm, I can solve these equations, and the solution to the network's equations is, and that's also a key point, it's a random probability. Why is it random? Two sources of randomness, the channel noise, the B sub i, and the coefficients. So the law of the n uh, solutions, the n-dimensional solutions, is a random probability measure. Key point. And uh, the goal is to characterize the limit, if it exists, of the average law with respect to the weights. Okay, so think of all possible networks and you take the average of their activity with respect to all possible weights, you get something which is still random and I'd like to know what happens when n goes to infinity to this particular probability distribution. It's not an easy problem. 
uh, and it needs, uh, you need to consider infinite sets of trajectories, since uh, there's an infinite number of neurons, of course. Uh, you need to be able to shift the neurons uh, back and forth, because one of the key ingredients to this uh, theory of large deviations is that the neurons are undistinguishable. This is the reason why I took the average. So it looks hopeless. You take the average, the neurons become indistinguishable, but of course there are individuals, so we'll recover from this. So I will consider the set of probability measures on this large set. This tells me how the uh, neurons' activity are distributed. And furthermore, the set of stationary uh, probability measures. So let me introduce the uh, final key ingredient, which is the uh, empirical measure. So think of your N neurons here. This is a, a braid, a golden braid of N neurons, big N, between minus N and plus N. This is uh, an element of the set of trajectories raised to the power N. And I will define this strange entity, which is the empirical measure, which uh, tells me basically uh, what it does. What does it do? it counts the relative frequency of this set of trajectories and all its shifted friends. Never mind the shifted friends. But it's a way of weighting where the neural, neuronal states go in that complicated uh, space. What is it from the mathematical standpoint? It takes n trajectories and it gives you a measure. So it's a mapping from the set of trajectories to the set of measures. Okay, now, uh, and the key mathematical idea is to do a mathematical trick, which is push forward the measure, uh, the measure QN, which is the measure that measures the activity of my N neurons through this empirical measure. In other words, you're going to look at which parts of the uh, uh, state space is occupied on average by these neurons through these math mathematical operations. Okay? This is a bit complicated, but uh, you should think of it, this measure pi n, as a probability measure on a set of probability measures. So it's even more complicated, but, but, uh, we, together with James McLaurin, uh, we proved uh, last year that this pi sub n is governed by a large deviation principle with a good rate function h. Okay? And in fact, this generalizes previous work by Chaim Somfolinsky from Hebrew University, one of the other funding uh, fathers of, uh, of computational neuroscience. The work of two mathematicians, uh, Gérard Benarus, who is the head of the Courant, um, Courant Institute, Alice Guillonnet, who is at MIT, and Olivier Moineau and Manuel Samelides from Toulouse University, uh, who had assumed that uh, the weights were independent. So, you have this large deviation principle, and one proves that there is a unique measure which minimizes H. This is the phenomenon I mentioned at the beginning of my talk about the concentration of measure. So there is a unique measure, which is the most important event. And uh, this measure, you can characterize it entirely. It's an infinite dimensional Gaussian measure, a Gaussian process. So you have a complete description of your infinite uh, number of neurons, which can be effectively computed. So numerical experiments are possible and we are actively uh, running these experiments. One key observation is that the limit measure is non-Markov. So let me spend one minute uh, on this. Uh, when you solve this set of n stochastic differential equations, we all know that the solution is Markov. When you let n go to infinity, the solution is non-Markov anymore. Okay? So uh, the, uh, the emergence, so it has infinite memory if you wish. So the uh, emergence of uh, new phenomenon, of emerging phenomena, may be hidden in this uh, non-Markov uh, measure. Let me summarize with some uh, line drawings, uh, pictures, what I've been talking about here. 
So we've proved the convergence in large space with a concentration of measure phenomenon. Phi n goes to this Dirac, which is localized at mu sub e. This is in the large space of probability distributions on the set of probability distributions, concentration of measure phenomenon. Not very useful from the practical viewpoint. More useful is the following result, namely that the probability distribution of our n neurons converges toward this famous uh, measure here. So the convergence holds when one averages over all possible networks, over uh, all possible weight. Not very useful either, because uh, you'd like to know what happens if you have one network. And we have this, uh, uh, this result, which tells us that if you fix, uh, if you don't average with respect to the weights, you still have convergence. So this is a result which is true for almost all synaptic weights. So you can draw at random a network, and lo and behold, you, you can characterize it with the, the limit measure. So uh, to conclude and uh, to uh, give you some take-home messages, large deviation theories of theory, of which I give you one simple example, they are essential in proving the existence of a limit law for the dynamics. If you're interested in characterizing these uh, finite size uh, networks with a limit measure. It allows you to characterize the law and it allows you to establish average over all possible networks and quenched uh, results almost everywhere. So the situation I just described is a natural generalization of the IID case, where the, where, which was considered by, say, Chaim Sompolinsky, where all the weights were uh, identically distributed, independent and identically distributed. Okay? And uh, moreover, if you assume that the maximum correlation distance between the synaptic weights is some number d, it means, okay, so you assume that the weights are not correlated uh, if you go further than d. When you solve the finite size equations, uh, you get correlations everywhere because of the connectivity. But in the limit, it turns out, and that's, a, I think, an important result, the mean field neurons are uncorrelated if they are separated by more than d in distance, okay? So that means that the representation that we end up with uh, through this analysis is sparse in the sense I described at the beginning of my presentation. So a few take-home messages. Uh, regarding, the, uh, regarding this particular work, uh, the independent synaptic weight hypothesis produces nice mathematical results, but it is very unrealistic from the biological viewpoint. If you take into account correlations between the synaptic weights, which is what biologists, neurobiologists tell us, it is more realistic, but the mathematical description is much more uh, complicated. And as I mentioned before, uh, the emerging phenomena like this cloud of birds, or yes, uh, might be contained in the non Markov description. Uh, we don't know, but we are investigating this very <coughs> seriously. And I will finish by emphasizing uh, other potential applications of large deviation techniques, which I, I really believe will become uh, uh, important in, uh, in, this, uh, in this area. So epilepsy is one of them uh, I'm looking at with colleagues, because epilepsy does involve very large neuronal populations, so it is a, a, a fantastic uh, way of applying these kind of ideas. Now, at a different level, I recently got acquainted uh, with uh, different processes that take place in the neuron, for example, and the piecewise deterministic processes, which are a combination of continuous, uh, continuous uh, processes and uh, discontinuous processes. For example, if you want to study the importance of stochastic ion channels, those fluctuations I was telling you about, they are, in a straightforward fashion, uh, amenable to the analysis through the large deviations. Uh, also, uh, if you look at messenger RNA transport within the neuron, motor-driven intracellular transport, it's also a mixture of continuous and discontinuous uh, processes which are, in a fairly straightforward fashion, amenable to this analysis. <coughs> 
And finally, uh, gene networks are certainly uh, a good, excellent candidate for this uh, analysis through large deviations. I guess, uh, and this is, this is it. <laughs>